Hey guys, all right, we're gonna do kind of more, maybe not a quick one in terms of not going two hours, but see if we can keep it under 30 or 30 minutes or so. I just wanted to do this video, taking back kind of my last video, where we talked about uh, what being a good building and really can do. And then uh, just gonna do another Bible study and dig into the Jonathan Clark video and uh, just compare what seven. Minute videos to compare to the Bible. Now, I do, I like Jonathan Clark, you know, the, the things he's been able to expose uh, in the uh, Catholic, Roman Catholic Church and the church and all that. Mm -hmm. But uh, this video popped up in my feed when I When I looked at it, it was, it was super, it was scary. And uh, it was something that I felt, you know, really heavily I needed to address because, um, and so it's like he's he's lacking something and he and he's adding a bunch of other things and uh and it's almost as if it's another gospel which isn't another gospel it's just something that's perverted now i pray this isn't the case and uh and a lot of the videos i've seen uh, i never really see the gospel but i see other things that just aren't so when you when you dig in uh but not getting to said uh let's let's jump into it let's watch this little two-minute clip and then we're, afterwards, we're going to go through and just break it out. Let's see here. The Bible says, Jesus said, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. The word truth means as in not concealing. You will know the truth as in not concealing. And the truth as in not concealed will set you free. The only truth that's concealed in the system is you were inverted. You're an angel and you were inverted by the host body system. You're stuck in there. You're upside down. The world is contrary to you. So when you turn the world upside down and backwards, you'll see that you're in a prison. Once you see you're in a prison, then you can accept the truth. First, you recognize the truth, then you accept it. Could it really be that simple? You're an angel. You're being destroyed by a serpent race, female energy. The race itself, the host body inverts you. It is the host body. The flesh is the serpent, female energy. It is the host body system. It inverts you. The angel is inverted within the system. When the angel arouses and wakes up from his stupor, he turns the other direction and then he sees the truth. He awakens and he awakens within a host body and then he can see the truth and the truth sets him free from the penalty of death, which is what the host body has to offer. Because when you die, if you don't get converted, your soul goes to the pit and you are assimilated into a race of locusts, which Satan is the king of the locusts with tails like scorpions. It is the most obvious thing in the world now. It's so obvious, it's stupid obvious. So I'll let you have a look at it in all its glory. And the scriptures bear it out. All right. So what's obvious about that that's so obvious? Well, I let's start. Actually, what's funny is in the beginning of his video, I like how it, it the, the scripture that starts. Uh, it's 1 Corinthians 15, 45 and 46 he has highlighted. And so it was written, the first man... Adam was made a living soul, and the last Adam, a quickening spirit. Howbeit, not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural. After that which is spiritual, right? So then the first man of the earth, earthy, the second man is the Lord from heaven. As the earthy, such are they, excuse me, such are they also that are earthy, as in heavenly, such are they that are heavenly. So, just looking here, the first seems to be natural and of the earth, earthy, right? Now, if we were angels stuck in a host body system, is what uh, Jonathan just claimed, the first would have been spiritual, right? And then to earthy and then back to spiritual. But that's just one small contradiction I see that, you know, the Bible clearly unfolds. But let's just get into the teaching and what he started with, and uh, which, which is, was what was alarming to me. The Bible says, Jesus said, you will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. The word truth means. The Bible says you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. And that's 100% accurate. But what is truth? What What is the truth of the Bible? Let, let's get in. Let's just look at some. Just we're gonna just hop around real quick and bounce around. Look at uh, what the Bible calls truth. Jesus saith unto him, John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If you had known me, you should have known my father also. And from henceforth, you know him and have seen him. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the father 
and it suffiseth us. Jesus said unto him, Have I been with you so long time with you, and thou hast not known me, Philip? For if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. Jesus is the truth here, he, he says. Let's go to John. Let's look at John 18. John 18, 37. Let's drop down. John 18, 37. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this sin was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Every one that is of the truth heareth my voice. So Jesus again saying, He is the truth. He beareth witness of the truth. And all them that hears, hears, hears his voice hear the truth. Right? Now let's go to John. John 8. What is it? Uh, John 8, 23 and 24. So John 8, 23, he says, you are from, he's talking to the, the Pharisees, obviously. You were from beneath. I am from above. You were of this world. I am not of this world. So right here we see that Jesus is saying, you were from this world. You were from beneath. I am from above. If we would have been from above, when you say, hey, you were once from above, but now you are from beneath, right? Because you have fallen as an angel. But he didn't say that. And what does he say? I, there, I said, therefore unto you that you shall die in your sins. For if you believe that not, excuse me, for if you believe that I am not, I'm tongue tying this all up. I said, therefore unto you that you shall die in your sins. For if you believe not that I am, you shall die in your sins. So Jesus claimed, if you don't believe he is the I am, you don't believe he is God, you will die in your sins. But again, this is more on the truth. What is the truth? Now let's get into how the truth saves us. What is the truth? Galatians 4.16. Oh, uh, well, before that, yeah, this, this verse is to remind me. I um I'm not, I know a lot of people like Jonathan Clack and because his videos have shown a lot of the enemy's plans and what they do and how they like to mock God. Now, in uh the epistles, we know that uh, I think it was Paul and Barnabas where they claim that these two are turning the world upside down, or might have been Paul and Peter. I can't remember the exact verse, but they're turning the world upside down. And we know Satan likes to mock everything that God has in the Bible. He can't come up with anything new, so he mocks. So what will he do? You know, he'll take, since God said he turns everything upside down, we know Peter was uh, put on a cross upside down. So it would be logical that Satan would then hide things in plain sight if you just turn them upside down so he can mock God and mock Christians and, uh, and just, you know, mock Jesus Christ. And we know that Satan does these things, right? Because he's a deceiver. And yet he can't come up with any new things, so he'll only mock God. So, and I'm not trying to say anything negative about John the Cleck. I'm just, I think he's in error with what he was saying here in his teachings. Uh, I know it's great that he can show all these things, but I think the clear word of scripture in the what is, you know, it doesn't change. And we shouldn't, we shouldn't change it. And there's two scriptures that I want to just bring to light again real quick. But Galatians says, I therefore, am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth. They zealously affect you, but not well. Yea, they would exclude you that you might affect them. But is it? But it is good to be zealously affected always in a good thing, right? Not only when I'm present with you, but so what he's saying, it's good to be zealously affected. You can have righteous indignation, but you just got to make sure it's pointed at, at the thing that is unrighteous, right? Not a person, but an idea. And an idea can infect and infest a lot of different other mindsets. So let's just jump into real quick, two things, two scriptures. If you stick to these two scriptures, uh, besides, I guess, another one, you should stick, always stick to just the scripture. But um, we, we are to study the show thyself approve, rightly dividing, so we can rightly divide the word of God, right? But also, if we go to 2 Peter 1, 6, eh, let's, yeah, let's go to first. I'm going to actually, I'm going to start in 1 Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians 4. 4 or 5, 1 Corinthians 4 or 5. Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the heart. And they shall, and, excuse me, and then shall every man have praise of God. All these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that you might learn in us not to think, of, not to think on men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up one against other. So this is saying, don't go beyond what is written. And if you do, you'll start to see men getting puffed up because they think they have something new, a new revelation. And 
it can distort things, especially the clear word of God. And I understand about studying eschatology and digging into the scriptures. That's different, right? But we're talking about the gospel message. We're talking about the what was and the what is. Not not trying to find out, you know, the rapture and looking at that, that which is great, you know, because you're studying. You just want to dig. You want to draw closer. You want to you want to discern the times. That's okay. But when we have the clear text of strict scripture, we can't go we can't go beyond what is written. And and this tells us why. And if we go beyond what is written, what are we doing? Well, Second Peter one, I think one Second Peter one. 119 tells us, 119, 120. We also, excuse me, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, talking about the Bible, whereunto you do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star rise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. So, in other words, uh, Peter's saying here, but by the, you know, being carried along by the Holy Spirit, so this is God's word here. That no scripture is a private interpretation, right? So we're not to take now prophecy is expounding on what scripture says, you know, drawing out the context, uh, exegesis, right? Explaining what it says, not eisegesis, where we incorporate our own ideas into the text. So if we don't go beyond what is written and we don't come up with our own private interpretation, we're set. But as a Berean, we're called to test everything. And that's what we're going to do today. We're going to test everything as we jump into the scripture. So again, as, uh, Galatians 4 16 says, have I become your enemy by telling you the truth? All right. Because that is the truth. And that this truth, this truth is how you're set free. And this is the only way to be set free. The only way to be saved. And let's dig into this a little bit more now. So Romans three, Romans three, seven, we're going to read, we're going to do a little bit of reading here. Uh, seven. We'll start at seven. We'll just go here. For if the truth of God hath more abounded through my lie unto his glory, why yet am I also judged as a sinner? And not rather, as we be slanderous, slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, let us do evil that good may come, whose damnation is just. Right? What then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise. For if we have proved both, excuse me, for we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles, that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood, Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known. All right. So when you see slander, or you see people attacking people. Um, you know, it's when they're quick to the judge, quick to get angry. Um, you know, it's it's the fruits of the spirit we're seeing here, and that we none of us have until we are in God. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that what things. Excuse me. Now we know that what things soever the law saith. It saith to them who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. So the law is to prove that the entire world is guilty of sin. Therefore, by deeds of the law, there shall be no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. You want me to keep going? Let's keep going a little bit more. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifest. Here's the truth. Being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God which is by faith of Christ Jesus unto all and upon all them that believe there is no difference for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God being justified freely by his grace by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God has set forth to be a pro, pro, propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God to declare, I say, at this time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. All right. So there's the start of the gospel message, right? This is the truth. The truth is that Jesus, God in flesh, came and lived the perfect life, right? Born of a virgin, lived the perfect life, kept the law, something that the first Adam couldn't do. So Jesus came to be the last Adam to do it. He kept the law perfectly. And gave his life willingly on a cross, 
on a tree, however you want to say it, to shed his blood so that we could be reconciled to the Father because he did what we could not do. And he did it freely for us. And all we have to do is believe on Christ Jesus that he gave his life, right? Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, the gospel message. Let's just look at this real quick. 1 Corinthians 15. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I have preached unto you, which also you have received and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I have preached unto you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I have also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. All right? So this is this is the truth. Let's go to 1 Timothy. Uh, let's say 2. 1 Timothy 2.4. 2, 4. All right? What is the will of God? For this is good and acceptable in the sight of our Lord, in the sight of our God and Savior, who will, who will, have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Where I am, wherefore, whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle, I speak the truth in Christ and lie not, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. I will, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. I don't need to keep going there. So what is it? Who will have all men come to the knowledge of truth? What is the truth? The truth is that there is one mediator between the God and man. It's Christ Jesus. He gave himself for us. That this is the truth. This is the only truth that can set you free. Neither give heed to fables, 1 Timothy 1, 4. Neither give heed to fables and endless gene genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith. There's a lot of things that we see um, that people post. And there's a lot of pictures that are kind of graphic uh, and it's in it believing fables and fables are what lead us from the Bible into interpretation, private interpretations. Right. So um, John the Clegg, you know, believes that we are fallen angels and that Genesis one creation was created by Satan and his angels. And in Genesis two, the father Genesis where it starts two four is the father's creation of Adam. All right. And we're going to jump into this uh, angels versus Jesus Christ being the creator and just going to dig it out. We're going to dig a lot of stuff. And this is where uh, we're just going to compare what he says to scripture. But first, I wanted to get the truth. And the, let's go into his video again real quick. As in not concealing. You will know the truth as in not concealing. And the truth as in not concealed will set you free. The only truth that's concealed in the system is you were inverted. You're an angel and you were inverted by the host body. Okay. So the only truth is that you were an angel and you were inverted in the host body system. And when you realize this truth, this truth will set you free. Well, what is Paul? I think Paul, you know, Paul says, uh, what is it? Um, oh my goodness. Let me, let me find it real quick. Uh, Romans, was it uh, of the world? One. I'm trying to find the, the right one. Another gospel, it's Galatians 1 6. Brain farted there for a second, sorry. Galatians 1 1 6. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ Jesus, or excuse me, into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another gospel, but there be some that trouble you that would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you, that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. I say again, as we have said before, so I say again, if any man preach another gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. Now, what Paul and him are preaching right here is the gospel message. What is? What did Paul and the, uh, the apostles receive? They received the gospel messages of Christ Jesus. Now, if you want to say you, that uh, we know that things were hidden. There's going to be things that are revealed in the last days. Um, you know, that's why Daniel sold the seal of books. We understand these things, but the gospel message and what saves us and what the truth is, is what Paul preached here. He's saying for what we have preached, if any man preached something else besides what we're preaching now, that is the truth. That man is to be accursed, right? And this is why I say it's scary uh, that Jonathan Cleck preaches the, what he's saying here, because it's, it's another gospel. And it's also something you have to do. You have to figure this out. You have to understand that you, and you must be converted, right? Let the two eyes become single. 
But that is the truth. That is not what can set you free. Now let's jump into, let's just jump into Genesis 1 real quick. Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. When you look at this in the beginning, you look at the word beginning here. This beginning is the first, the beginning, the chiefest, the first fruits. This word is the same. Uh, this first fruits, this beginning, uh, excuse me, the first fruit. This is the same word that's offered in the feast of first fruits, right? This is the unleavened offering. This is Jesus Christ, right? Jesus Christ in Revelation says, I am the first and the last. I am the beginning. I am the end. I am the Alpha and Omega. Jesus is the beginning. All things. Let's go to John 1 real quick. John 1, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was the life and the light and the life was the light of men and the light shineth in the darkness and the darkness comprehended it not. All things were made by Jesus for Jesus through Jesus. He withholds all things together. Even when Jesus was in the world, he was his, he was still withholding all things together because Jesus is before all things, right? Galatians, Jesus is before all, meaning he's always been before all and will be all in all, right? But let's go back to now, let's go back to Genesis real quick. Um, Genesis 1. So we see here in the beginning, God created. So you can look at it this way. In Jesus, God created the heavens and earth. Because what? We know that the Father is responsible for creation. We know Jesus is responsible for creations. So what is it? In the beginning, in Jesus, God created the heavens and earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. There's your Father, Son, Holy Spirit right there in the beginning. So now when we go down to Genesis uh, 127, or 24, let me see, 127, uh, 26, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish, right? And then we go to 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Now let's look at this. Genesis 5 here. This is uh, uh, Adam's descendants, right? Generations of Adam. In the, in the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made he him. Male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam in the day they were created. So we see the same wording, male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam. Now, was Eve's name Adam? No, it was not. Adam can be, is the name of Adam, obviously, but it's also a word used to, for uh, mankind. So he called their name Adam. So he's, when he created humans, this is mankind was to be created. He called their name Adam in the day they were created. So when you go back to Genesis 1, right, when you look here, now you can see the same thing where let us make man in our image, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So God created man in his own image. In the image created he him. Male and female created he them. Right? So male and female. Same thing we have. And five is just bearing it out in further detail. But call their name Adam in the day that they were created. Now, let's uh, let's go let's go a little bit further. So now let's, let's just jump. Now, if you want to say that we were angels and that we fell, as uh, John the Cleck says, system you're stuck in there you're upside down the world is contrary to you so when you turn the world upside down and backwards you'll see that you're in a prison once you see you're in a prison then you can accept the truth first you recognize the truth then you accept it what's the truth the truth is that we are sinners in a fallen creation and that jesus christ came and lived the life that we couldn't live and that all who confess jesus and believe on him and are born again and covered by his blood as a free gift that we can't that we can't earn we don't deserve it's given to us freely for all those who believe we are saved and set free at that moment that is the truth can it really be that simple yep you're an angel okay so you're an angel if we were an angel explain to me this all right and just i'm just going to show how everything he's stating the bible does contradict it or there's other things that would make God unfair, unjust, right? Because if we were an angel, would we be considered a stupid angel, right? Or are we just an angel that can be duped? Because obviously we're an angel when we, and we already beheld the face of glory because we would have seen Jesus, right? We would have, Jesus would have been the face of the Father. So we would have seen his grace. We would have been there. We would have been, we'd have seen everything and we'd have been smart. But we still would have chose to come down and have sex with humans. That's what we wanted. And if you know the first with Enoch, right? When the 200 angels fell and you know that story, um, or I mean, excuse me, in Genesis where, uh, you know, the angels of God came and took daughters, right? We know that they were all punished and look what Jude says. 
I will therefore put in <clears throat> in you remembrance that you come, excuse me, that you once knew, that you once knew this, how that the Lord having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward restored them that believed not. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains of darkness unto the judgment of the great day. So of these angels, the angels that were, you know, after Noah, or before Noah, excuse me, before Noah, if they would have left their first estate, but now they're bound in chains of darkness until the judgment of the great day. And we know that uh, hell was created for it, Satan and his angels who rebelled, right? So if they are being locked under chains of darkness until that great day where they will be tossed in hell, explain to me how we get out of that judgment. How are How is it that they came down and took daughters, but now we're coming down and taking daughters, right? Because this is our sin. This is what we did. We would have been angels coming down. Why are we not held in darkness until that great day? Why did Jesus get to come die for us? Yet he doesn't, he doesn't get to die for these angels, right? Do you see the contradiction? How does that not make sense, right? And if, and if we were, if this world was a prison, as he just said, why does God say after the sixth day, now, now he says that this is Satan and his angels here, but after the sixth day, God says, you know, um, it was good. It was very good. Everything was great, right? And if we go to Genesis 2, here's the problem with saying this is Satan and the angels that created us, right? Um, because first off, Jesus said he created everything and all things were created through him and for him. But if we go to Genesis uh, 2, 1 to 2, 3, this is still part of the first creation. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and the host of them. And on the seventh day, on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made in his hands and he rested what he had made. Excuse me, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had made. So we see, we see him resting here. I'm just sorry. I'm uh, I'm trying to want to I'm playing music in the background just because I, I I like having some music in the background doing this. It just helps me to study. Um, so let's change that. Let's get on to this. So God, when it says God rested, He didn't rest physically like He was tired. Just so you know, because people think that oh He rested uh, like the Sabbath day rest. Well, because Jesus says in John that. The Father worketh unto this day, and so do I. This is Jesus claiming divinity, right? But he's resting from the works. He's enjoying what he made, and he's resting in it. You know, he's happy. He's content. He's resting with his creation. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. Now, how can Satan bless the seventh day and sanctify it? He can't, right? And if how do we know that this isn't Satan, that this is God? Because when you come into Genesis 2, 4, and you go down, there's no mention of the Sabbath day. Yet... When we go to the Sabbath day in Exodus, let's jump into Exodus 20. All right, Exodus 20, what is it? 20, uh, 28 verse 10, yeah. Um, look what Jesus says. Um, oh, this is important too. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that take his name in vain. How do, how do you take his name in vain? People say, you know, cursing, saying GD it, um, things like that. But when you say the Lord tells me something or the Lord gave me a vision or the Lord does this and that thing does not come to pass or if it's a vague generality and we know uh, the Lord does not give vague generalities of something that's supposed to happen or vague interpretations and you, you claim that the Lord's telling you something or has said to you that is taking his name in vain because you're bringing Sully on his name saying he said something he did not say. Therefore, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor manservant, nor maidservant, nor cattle, nor the stranger that is in the gates, right within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and the earth, and the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and holiday. Excuse me, this is not Satan. <laughs> this is the direct correlation of what I just read in Genesis 2 excuse me, Genesis 2, 1, 2, 1 through 3. This is God, the Lord God. Notice this is the Lord God, Jehovah, being spoken about in Exodus, which is why Jesus Christ, the Father, and the Holy Spirit are one, right? One God, three persons. Again, who blessed it? He did. There's no mention in Genesis 2. So there's a contradiction in Scripture, and we can't go past the clear text of Scripture, and we can't have a private interpretation come in from the Talmuds or something that is known to have uh, you know, pagan things written all through it, right? And also the traditions of men. And that's what we're not told to follow. 
right? So let's let's look again. Look and again. Some, there's another reference to the Sabbath day, which takes us all the way back to Genesis two, right? Two one through three. And so let's look at Deuteronomy five here. Is it Deuteronomy five? I believe it's Deuteronomy five. 12, 5, 12. Thou shalt not. Let's. I like go through nine. Thou shalt bow. Shalt the. Thou shalt not bow down thyself unto them, nor serve them. For I am the Lord thy God and a jealous God. See the Lord. This is capital Lord. This is Jehovah. This is, you know, you can't say this is Satan. Visiting the iniquity upon the fathers and the children unto the third and fourth generations to them that hate me. And showing mercy unto thousands of them that love and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guilt, guiltless that taketh the name in vain. Keep the Sabbath day to sanctify it as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee. Six days thou shalt labor and do all thy work. But in the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Right? Remember, because God commanded thee to keep the Sabbath day holy because he, he rested from his labors. So this is, again, this is to the Israelites. This is not to us. Our Sabbath rest now is in Jesus Christ because this was all about pointing us to Jesus, our Messiah, our Savior. And now that his blood covers us and we understand the truth. And the truth is that Jesus Christ is Lord God, Savior of all mankind, right? To all those who will call upon his name. Jew or Gentile, Greek, doesn't matter, everybody. Um, all one in Christ. That is the truth. That is what sets you free. This is the only thing that can set you free. Not believing, even if it was the case that we were a fallen angel. Scripture says nothing about, hey, you need to understand that you're a fallen angel. And that you come into a host body system. And once you realize this truth, this truth will set you free. No, that's not what saves you, man. That's not what saves you. And it's another gospel. And I, and I worry uh, that John the Clegg is missing this. And I, I don't, I, and I pray and I pray for everybody who watches this. And I'm not doing this out of, uh, you know, disrespect. I'm just concerned that you're not seeing the truth and the beauty of scripture and you're believing a lie because we are not angels in a host body system. All right, and I could prove this out to you by going through all the words, doing everything he does. And we'll get into that a little bit. But let's just look at uh, what, what God says about angels, right? Um, actually, I want to get to, let's go to uh, creation of the world. We're talking about the creation of the world again, where it was uh, Jesus Christ. I want to jump into, what is it, Colossians? Colossians 1, 16. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, again, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that he in all things might have preeminence. So again, what did Genesis say in the beginning? In the beginning, Jesus. In the beginning, in Jesus, God created the heavens and the earth. This is what's being told to us right here. Prophesy, prophecy from the very first scripture. That's revelation. That's new revelation. This is not new revelation, but that that's what's amazing about scripture. The more you dig into it, the more you'll learn. But you don't have to go outside it. There's so many things that if you just study and dig into that you'll find it'll open your eyes. The word of God is enough and is sufficient for all that we need. Right? But let's look at uh let's look, look at another one. Hebrews 11. Let's go to Hebrews 11. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of the things which do appear. Right? So what is this saying? The word of God framed everything. And if everything that came into existence didn't come from something that we can, a matter or something. It came from nothing. God is the only one who could do these miracles and create something from nothing, right? Because God is outside of time, space, matter. He is in all, before all, through all. Everything is because of God, right? And God doesn't, he's not a, God is not a man, right? This is Hosea 11. God is not a man. He's a God. You know, he's bigger than everything. Nothing can, can, the world cannot contain him, you know, so he is invisible. He's, however you want to describe it, he's spirit. And the only way we see the Father is when we behold Jesus Christ, when we see the face of God. It's because Jesus is the exact representation, the exact substance of the Father revealed to us. 
because Jesus is God. Right? So again, the the Bible doesn't contradict itself. It says God made man. God made everything. I didn't say the angels made it. Nowhere in here does it tell us that angels have the power to create. It doesn't. Angels don't have from what I know from the Bible, they don't have they don't have the power to create. They're extremely powerful beings, but in uh and even if you want to dig into when uh, the angels fell down and they corrupted, right? The the sons and daughters of men. It didn't say anything about them able to create anything, you know? They were, otherwise, they would have been like, look at me. Look, I can create a world for you. Look, I am God. They didn't do that. We don't have that in the Bible, so we can't say that. We can only stick to what scripture says. Don't go beyond what is written, right? Don't And don't have private interpretation. Uh, let's see right here. Romans 120. We'll finish it with uh, Jesus being creator. I want to say Romans 120. But there's so many scriptures that we could do this, but you can't do the other way around. You can't do it the other way around because it's not true. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish hearts were darkened, were darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and they changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like by corruptible man, and to birds and the four footed beasts and creepy things. You know, we're 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 going beyond the scriptures here. We're not saying we're angels and that you got to understand that you're an angel in a, in a, in a prison. And if God said the world was good, how is it a prison? We know it's fallen right now. We know this world is not ours, right? We're soldiers here because it's fallen, but it was good in the beginning and it wasn't created as a prison. There's just no truth to that. Wherefore God also gave them up to the uncleanness, to their lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this, cause God, for this cause, God gave them up to unto vile affections, for even unto their women did change the natural use unto that which is against nature. And likewise also, the men leaving the natural use of women burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves the recompense of their error, which was meat. Right? There's your, uh, uh, when they said God doesn't say anything about homosexuals in the Bible. Uh, well, it's right there. Um, and even as they did not like and they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, dissent, malignity, whispers, fallen angels wanting to have sex, backbite. Oh, I'm sorry. That wasn't there. That's not a list of our sins. Backbiters, haters of God, disrespectful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affections, implacable and merciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death. What what are these? This is how we're worthy of death because we're all sinners. We've all fallen. We've all gone astray. There is none that seeketh after God. No, not one. There's none righteous. All right? Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only to do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. So, um, again, being a fallen angel or an angel who fell wanting to have sex isn't on our list of sins. Our sin, the sin nature we have, th this is what, uh, you know, this is, I don't want to belabor it. You know what the truth is. Um, let's see here. And now let's just go into just what angels do. And this is interesting, right? So if, if we were an angel and we fell and now we're men, but we're going to get to come angels again, look what it says angels do. Right, angels do. We're gonna go to Hebrews 1:14. Are they not all ministering, ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? So it's saying here, when you look at this, <clears throat> the angels are sent forth to minister unto us so we can be heirs of salvation. Right. And then when you keep digging into further what it is, first Corinthians, let's say six, uh th three. Know you not that we shall judge angels? First Corinthians 6, 3, know ye not that we shall judge angels, how much more things pertain to, uh, to this life, All right? So what are we seeing here? Um, we, we will judge angels. Oh, oh, let me see, 6, 3, let's keep going. If then ye have judgments of pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church, right? 
I speak unto your I speak to your shame. It is so that there is not a wise man among you, no, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren. But brother goeth to law with brother. And you know, this is Paul. He's berating this group because they're taking fellow believers to court. But brother goeth to law with brother and before the and, and go, excuse me, before the unbelievers. Now, therefore, there is an utterly a fault among you because you go to law with one another. Why do you not rather take wrong? Why do you rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Nay, ye do wrong and defraud, and that your brethren. Know ye not that you, excuse me, know ye not that the un unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. Uh, that was just in Romans 1. This is your lesbian and gay verse. Nor thieves, no covetous, nor drunkards, nor violers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the spirit of our God. Right? So let me see if I need to go further. He was 15 years old. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought unto the power of any. Meats for the belly and the belly for meats, but God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not... For fornication but for the lord and the lord for the body and god hath both raised us up the lord and will also raise us by his own power know ye not that your your bodies and the members are christ know you not that your bodies are the members of christ shall i then take the members of christ and make them members of a harlot god forbid so this was going to also uh you know if if we were fallen angels and came down you know for wanting to have sex why does God bless marriage? Why does God bless, you know, uh, relationships inside the home, right? Uh, this is a beautiful thing created for us, right? But then if we think if we fell, if we weren't supposed to do this. I mean, where would the angels, it, it just doesn't make sense. How would, there, how would the angels have fallen into a host body system when they saw this, uh, the daughters of men? Would those daughters of men have been fallen angels first? See, it's, a, it, it's, it's trying to square a circle. It doesn't make sense to me. And scripture doesn't bear it out. So let's see here. Um, okay, Luke, last one. Let's go to Luke. Luke, I want to say Luke uh, 20, 34. We're going to the Sadducees and the Pharisees when they ask about the resurrection. Jesus answering unto them, Luke 24, 20, 34. Luke answering them said, the children of this world marry and are given in marriage. See, the children of this world are, world marry. Adam God took Eve from Adam's side and walked her to him. He gave them a marriage to be fruitful, to multiply, right? We have that command to be fruitful and multiply. That's a blessed thing. But why is this? But why is in this world where your fallen angel came down and was deceived? It's not. But they which are accounted worthy to obtain that world and the resurrection from the dead, neither married nor are given in marriage. Neither can they die anymore for they are equal unto the angels and are the children of God being children of the resurrection. So if we were angels, again, falling down here, then we're going to become angels. Why it says we are like angels, right? We are not angels, but they are equal unto the angels. Neither can they die anymore, for they are equal unto the angels and are the children of God. So if we're equal, wouldn't we just go back to being angels? See, it's contradictions everywhere. Now, let's jump into here. You're being destroyed by a serpent race, female energy. The race itself, the host body, in virtue, it is the host body. The flesh is the serpent, female energy. It is the host body system. It inverts you. The angel is inverted within the system. When the angel arouses and wakes up from his stupor. So there, there's a reference in the Old Testament about awake, awake thou, thou sleepest, right? Awake. Um, what, what are we awakened to? What's the reference there to? What's the, re well, let's look in the New Testament and see what the reference is to awaking or to becoming, uh, you know, let's see. I don't want to say the word woke. It's just. Media made us hate that word. Um, 1 Corinthians 15, 34. What are we, what are we, what are we supposed to awake to? Look at 1 Corinthians 15, 34. Awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Right? Awake to righteousness. What's righteousness? Well, being clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, understanding the gospel message that he died for us. This is what we're awake, supposed to awake to. Not to awake to realizing that you're a fallen angel. It's, see, it's not, it's not there. And it's twisting, adding to scripture. 
right? And that is not a gospel message that you should say. It should never come out of your mouth that that is the truth. Even if, if it was some semblance of the truth, the truth should be that Jesus Christ died for your sins and that when you start to dig and you, you draw closer to the Lord, he reveals things to you. And then he could have revealed that, which isn't in scripture though. But let's keep going. Let's, uh, let's look at another verse for Ephesians. It's Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5, 14. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See that you work, see that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but be wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Right? So what is it? Um, and be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves to one another in the fear of God. So that's what I'm doing. I'm just trying to, I'm trying to provoke us to be, you know, provoke us to do good works, provoke us to repent if we're in error of Scripture, right? Because when he says, awake thou that sleepest and arise from the dead, we are all dead. We are all children of Satan. We are all gone astray until we find Christ. Christ shall give thee light. John 1, right? He is the light of men. So when we find Christ and we believe on him, we are buried in baptism. Romans 6, 4, we are buried. This is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the one baptism. It's not actually being dunked in water and you know in my opinion this is something you should do because it's a commandment but what saves you is you must be baptized in the holy spirit and how do you do this the moment you believe in jesus christ right and you believe that he died for your sins you are now buried with him and raised again and baptized in the holy spirit and the holy spirit comes upon you and seals you because you are now his forever right you are sealed into that great day and he is confident paul says i'm confident that he who began a good work in you will fin will finish it when you are truly born again you are his right so what are we awakened from? We are awakened from this fallen word, world be, that our eyes are blinded because of media and television and everything that says, you know, religion is not real. We are blinded. But then God the Father puts a light out there for us. Somehow we hear a message of the gospel. Somehow we, we see something on YouTube that says, uh, you know, um, now you can see both eyes are sealed. Now, just because this message here is totally wrong, God can take something that's wrong and turn it to good. Right. And people can be saved in false churches all the time. But when you preach the gospel, when you do a video, when you tell somebody you are shining a light, shining a light, you are being the light of Christ. Christ in you is working. The works that we do are not our works. They are Christ Jesus works. He is in us that does these good works. So that light that shineth in a dark place, that's the light of the, the truth. That's that's the father trying to draw all men to himself. Right. So when somebody sees this and rejects it or rejects the prompting of the Holy Spirit and they don't want to, you know, follow the light, which is Christ, then that's how they're falling asleep, dead to this world, dead in your sins and your trespasses. But when you wake, you are awoken because you believe in Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior. All right. This is how, this is what that meaning of awoke is. Now, John it turns the, the other direction. John the Collect goes on to say that, you know, if you die, you go to the pit and you're in the locust army, but scripture doesn't bear that out either. And then he sees the truth. He awakens. And he awakens within a host body, and then he can see the truth, and the truth sets him free from the penalty of death, which is what the host body has to offer. Because when you die, if you don't get converted, your soul goes to the pit, and you are assimilated into a race of locusts. No scripture says that. In fact, we do have we have kind of proof of this, right? We have um, the rich man and Lazarus. When the rich man died, right, uh, and Lazarus died, Lazarus went to Abraham's bosom, and rich man went into the the pit, this gulf separated him, but La the rich man could still see Lazarus. And what did he ask Father Abraham to do, right? He said, Father Abraham, send Lazarus over here that he may dip, that he, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented, tormented in this flame, right? And then Abraham spoke back to him, you know what he said. But if, would it not have made sense here to say, Father Abraham, send Lazarus over here with the switch braid so he can cut me out of this cocoon? You know, not that I'm in fire, I'm in torment, but he would have been stuck sealed inside a little cocoon, right? If you're going to say you're in a honeycomb, uh, but he doesn't say that. He says, come over here, give me some water, please. I'm tormented by these flames. So again, that, that doesn't make sense. And if you want to go to the, the spot in the Old Testament where it talks about the, 
the seductress, right? And she lures guys in and the hollows of her eyes. And the hollow is this word, and uh, I'm sorry, I'm not going to it, but in Hebrew means like a, a, a pillows. It also means a honeycomb, like a bee, like a, a wasp kind of nest, this thing, right? But then when you look at that wasp, that honeycomb, right? Um, it's a, it's a, a reference, a metaphor to uh, um, in Proverbs where it says, you know, that sweet nectar, the honeycomb, we are enticed by her, right? This one that wants to lead us astray so she can encapsulate us with her beauty and fall into the pit of hell, right? Um, I can't remember the exact verse, sorry. Uh, I should have wrote it down. But this is that honeycomb reference, right? Which goes back to Proverbs. But then even so, when you look at this word hollows, it means the the plump of the eyes, right? The, the woman's to put makeup on her eyes, which is something they were taught by the angels, right? To beautify themselves, right? Again, what, what's happening here is that we're following the lust of the flesh, that we're walking by the spirit of this world instead of the spirit of God who sets us free. So we are we are, we are following our flesh, our sin nature, and running straight forward into hell. And a lot of times, yes, it is. Uh, uh, sex is one of the biggest selling things, right? That's everywhere you look. This is what it is, right? But it's not. It's not a locust army and going into the pit. That's not in scripture. I know you can you can connect things and make it fit, but then uh, Rich Man and Lazarus go against that. Um, see if there's anything else. Which Satan is the king of the locusts with tails like scorpions. Okay, that was it. So I say this just as a warning and a precaution out of love. It's just um, the truth is that you're a sinner in need of a savior and Jesus Christ is the way. And that everything in this video I just proved to be true or uh, false, right? By what scripture says. Um, I know there's things that you can glean uh, and you can show and you can wake up people. And yeah, it can wake people up to reading the scriptures. So what I want to do is just provoke you to do good works. I want to provoke you to be a Berean. I want to provoke you to keep things in context, especially when it comes to salvation, right? You can't, you must believe that Jesus Christ is God. You must believe that his blood covers you, right? These are essential doctrines. And if you don't believe that, and if you're not preaching that, you're preaching another gospel. So that being said, I think we can end it here. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, again, I pray if John the Clark sees this, I pray he would, you know, uh, stop. I know it's been a long time he's been teaching this, but if you could just take what I said and just compare it and just see where my heart is, it's just for him to repent of saying that what the truth is the truth is converting to a host body system that's not the truth of the gospel it's not that's not how you're saved you cannot be saved by knowing that nowhere if that's all you believe you will not be saved and if you die you will go to hell right with that being said uh god bless you guys thank you uh, thank you for listening all those who made it to the end i pray you guys are well and stay strong uh, we'll see you in the next one god bless <laughs>